33. Political Atheism Because God is the creator of heaven and earth and all things therein, all meaning and all law come from him. This is the emphatic meaning of scripture repeatedly, as for example, these statements. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33 verse 6 All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3 And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 We are plainly told that all things were made by God, and that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is not only he for whom all things were made, but also the heir of all things. All things are held together and function because of God the Son, so that nothing exists or has meaning or direction outside of him. God is thus the source of all things as sovereign or Lord over all, and therefore all meaning, law and justice are derived from him totally and absolutely. Man, however, in his rebellious desire to be his own God, Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, seeks to separate these things from God. Very early Hellenic philosophy reduced God to the inactive status of a first cause and located, that is, the good, the true and the beautiful, justice and all else, in forms or ideas, universals which were an inherent part of being in general. Meaning was thus separated from God and made a part of the universe. The philosophers who taught these things were the intellectual fathers of the tyrants of Greece. The relocation of meaning, law and justice in a source outside of God persisted. A popular form of this has been the natural law doctrine. Although scripture is clear that all creation is fallen and therefore reflects that fact despite its inescapable fact of creation by God, men still hold nature and its supposed law to be normative. Psalm 19 does indeed declare the fact of the glory of God manifested in all creation, but it is the law of the Lord which is perfect, not the universe. Men have sought to relocate meaning, justice and law on a level below God because this gives him a convenient starting point. Instead of being judged by God and his transcendental but revealed law and justice, men have, when law and justice are located outside of God, an instrument whereby they can judge God. Churchmen regularly appeal to their humanistic ideas of law, justice and love to tell us what God cannot be, 
whatever the Bible may say. To establish a realm of meaning and truth outside of God means to subject God to the criticism of the men who determine the nature of that separate realm of meaning. As a result, in various eras of the modern age in particular, men have seen as the critical point of reference some concepts which they have declared to be central to life. When the centre of law and sovereignty is located outside of God, a problem ensues. An important aspect of the being of God, an incommunicable attribute, is his unity. Van Til wrote of this, We distinguish between the unity of singularity, singularitatis, and the unity of simplicity, simplicitatis. The unity of singularity has reference to numerical oneness. There is and can be only one God. The unity of the simplicity signifies that God is in no sense composed of parts or aspects that existed prior to himself. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 10, 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. In no sense can this be true of the universe, nor of man. The created order is one of differences, of a variety of parts and aspects, and of differing importance. Just as Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. to the contrary, a grain of sand is not on the same level of importance as a man, nor is a baboon. However, all men are not equal. I have my areas of competence by the grace of God, but there are millions of men who undoubtedly surpass me in many ways, in their spheres of competence and calling, whatever they may be. If I judge myself by man, I invite trouble and distress, whereas if I judge myself in terms of God's calling, I can work in peace. If my source of evaluation is God, I know that, by His grace, I have peace and a calling. If my source of evaluation is from men, then instead of grace and peace, envy and hostility will govern me. In 1832, Eugene Stoffels, in writing to Alexis de Tocqueville, asked de Tocqueville if he shared with Stoffel his political atheism we do not know exactly what Stoffels meant by that term, but we can say that political atheism exists wherever men ground the state and society in anything other than the triune God and his law word. We know that de Tocqueville held that institutions are secondary in their influence on the shape of society because political societies are not what their laws make them, but what sentiments, beliefs, Ideas, habits of the heart make them. We would say that politics and society are what the religious faith of a culture determined them to be. Tocqueville said that he envied the fact that the United States had an essentially stateless government because public force is everywhere. He could write in 1831 that France was moving toward a democracy without limits. The world was taking a new form, and a dangerous one. De Tocqueville in 1842 wrote from Paris to Paul Kilmorgan, We are like an army embarking on the conquest of the world, while the enemy pillages and destroys homes. This was a reason for de Tocqueville's great interest in the United States, where the new spirit was best in evidence. In France, the triumph of equalitarianism had been evil in its consequences. The spell of the royalty is broken, but it has not been succeeded by the majesty of the laws. The people have learned to despise all authority, but fear now exhorts a larger tribute of obedience than that which was formerly paid by reverence and by love. I perceive that we have destroyed these independent beings which were able to cope with tyranny single-handed, but 
It is the government that has inherited the privileges of which families, corporations and individuals have been deprived. The weakness of the whole community has, therefore, succeeded to that influence of a small body of citizens, which, if it was sometimes oppressive, was often conservative. The division of property has lessened the distance which separated the rich from the poor, but it would seem that the nearer they draw to each other, the greater is their mutual hatred, and the more vehement the envy and the dread with which they resist each other's claims to power. The notion of rights is alike insensible to both classes, and force affords to both the only argument for the present and the only guarantee for the future. After Rousseau, law had been made the expression of the general will of the people, and this had led to a bitter struggle of differing groups to be that will of the people. As a result, force affords the only argument for the present and the only guarantee for the future. Instead of a law and justice coming from the Almighty, there was now a new source and the political sphere became the arena for a new war of the gods. Of England, de Tocqueville wrote that Parliament was omnipotent. He cited Delhomme, who said, It is a fundamental principle with the English lawyers that Parliaments can do everything except making a woman a man or a man a woman. The power and jurisdiction of Parliament, says Edward Cook, 4th Institutes, number 36, is so transcendent and absolute that it cannot be confined either for causes or persons within any bounds. It hath sovereign and uncontrollable authority in making, confirming, enlarging, restraining, abrogating, repealing, reviving and expounding of laws concerning matters of all possible denominations, ecclesiastical or temporal, civil, military, maritime or criminal. This being the place where that absolute despotic power which must in all governments reside somewhere is entrusted by the constitution of these kingdoms. All mischiefs and grievances, operations and remedies that transcend the ordinary course of the laws are within the reach of this extraordinary tribunal. It can regulate or new model the succession of the crown, as was done in the reigns of Henry VIII and William III. It can alter the established religion of the land, as was done in a variety of instances in the reigns of King Henry VIII and his three children. It can change and create afresh even the constitution of the kingdom and of the parliaments themselves as was done by the Act of Union and the several statutes for triennial and septennial elections. It can, in short, do everything that is not naturally impossible to be done, and therefore some have not scrupled to call its power by a figure rather too bold, the omnipotence of Parliament. In America, de Tocqueville held... The sovereign authority is religious, and this fact preserved the United States from status tyranny, but he saw that a certain number of Americans pursue a peculiar form of worship from habit more than from conviction. In 1831, he wrote from the United States to Louis de Kergolay that while the American Sabbath was strict and Observed Judaically, the preaching was moralistic, not theological. The decline of Christianity's hold on Americans would lead, in time, to the erosion of freedom. The state cannot provide an ethic because its rule rests on power, coercive power. In the modern era, we are seeing again what destroyed the Middle Ages the transfer of law and justice from God to the state. This means also the transfer of every department of human life to status control. Russell wrote of the medieval shift. 
All these parties joined in, heaping power upon the ruler. Law, once an edict of God imparted to the reason of mankind, became the command of a sovereign and the interest of the stronger, and society as a whole moved slowly away from an ethical mooring and advanced to the position in which we find it today. Law becomes the will of the state, and justice is what the state does. Evils have been common to all of history, but evil is never more oppressive than when administered by the agencies of justice, such as departments of state. In 1988, when a Texan state worker lost his job, he also lost his home. Because of the condition of the Texas real estate market, the bank wrote off his $80,000 mortgage loan as valueless. The U.S. Internal Revenue Service then billed the man for back taxes and penalties on $80,000 in unreported income. As Ron Paul reported it, says the IRS, if a lender takes a house back at a value less than the outstanding loan, as is all too common now in Texas, and that will be replicated nationwide, the difference will be considered taxable income. In much of the world, the evils of statism are far greater. One can add that, in the United States, some legal recourses are open. However, it must be added that, in any appeal to a state court, the court will simply be guided by the rules of the IRS and of Congress and the federal courts. It will not be guided by any higher law of God. There is no recognition nor admission that law or justice can exist above and beyond the state. Manas is trapped in a closed world. The state? In a closed society, a culture which denies God and his law, it is the will of man which prevails. Thus, in Islam, during the era of the Fatimid Caliphate, the ruling man became the incarnate deity. Although Allah was affirmed, society was a closed world because the Caliph was Allah incarnate. Hakim believed divine reason was incarnate in him. He also told the Byzantine emperors, Constantine IX, 1025 to 1028, and Michael IV, 1034 to 1041, that he was the Christian Messiah reincarnated. Hakim may have been mad as he killed Christians and Jews and oppressed his own people, but his tyranny, while more exotic at times, cannot equal that of modern Marxist and other tyrant states. Basic to modern statism are a number of premises, two of which are most important. The first is the elimination of God from human affairs, or in Stoffel's words, political atheism. By substituting a source of law other than the triune God, Men replace God's sovereignty with their own and God's final court of appeals and judgments with themselves. A closed world results, man-made and man-governed. This is the goal of fallen man and it is a great illusion that such a realm can be successfully maintained. Because they are antinomian, because they deny the validity of God's law, most churchmen are themselves at the least, political atheists. For them, God has no word except for man's soul and its salvation. As a result, the world is surrendered to the devil, and this is done as though it were a religious duty to surrender man to tyranny. Second, political atheism is promoted in the name of equality. The goal of fallen man is to be his own God and law, determining good and evil for himself. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 His goal for civil government is to equal God by governing and controlling all things, and hence his desire for a Tower of Babel, a one-world order governed by man. Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 to 9 
Equality has a liberating sound to modern man, but, as Bustle observed, the equalization of all men before a single and central law is, of course, the slavery of all, and servitude to an official bureaucracy is less tolerable than obedience to a local family. Quote, equality, end quote, is the modern form of slavery, because it is an instrument whereby all institutions, families, and religious authorities are eroded and destroyed. The egalitarian state stresses destructive and erosive freedoms such as sexual license, abortion, homosexuality, euthanasia, drugs and more as a means of eroding the positive social forces such as family and church. Such a state presents itself as the champion of liberty because it enhances individual irresponsibility whereas true freedom means responsibility and accountability. It is the, quote, insane, end quote, who are neither responsible nor predictable. Their anarchic, quote, freedom, end quote, is precisely their bondage. Where radical individual, quote, freedom, end quote, triumphs, irresponsibility reigns, and also the tyrant state, Tyrant states triumph in the name and under the banner of liberty, fraternity and equality. The great crimes of the modern era have commonly been committed in the name of liberty. When men deny God and his law, we see then that truly democratic tendency to repose a blind faith in an autocratic leader whose word is law if God does not provide the law, men will. And if God's incarnation is rejected, a man will be accepted. I glance backward at the pontificate of Celestine V, Pietro di Moroni, 1215-1296, who, as a monk and hermit, acquired a reputation for sanctity is an order. He founded the Order of Celestines, circa 1254. At the age of 80, he was elected Pope in 1294. Europe felt the need for a holy man to lead the faithful, and men were full of revulsion towards venal and ungodly men in church and state. Without his knowledge, he was elected Pope, and great multitudes flocked to greet him, rejoicing that holiness and the Holy Spirit would now rule. The spiritual Franciscans were overjoyed, and some saw Celestine V as the first legitimate pope since Constantine. For five months, Celestine V sought to reform the church, to the dismay of powerful and not-so-powerful churchmen and statesmen alike. Apparently, pressure was exerted to lead him to abdicate. Given the frustration and futility Celestine V experienced, he was willing to do so despite the tears and prayers of earnest priests and monks. He was detained and imprisoned after abdicating because of his popular appeal and was probably either executed or so mistreated that he died. Celestine V had been made Pope because it was recognised that holiness was needed to save Europe and the Church. Very quickly, it was apparent that the holiness was impolitic and out of place, and so Celestine had to go. Europe pursued its course into disaster. Political atheism governs our age as it did Celestine's, and again men despise holiness and they reject God and his law. The judgments which are the prelude to change and salvation are very near.